to confess something to you. <laughs> I feel like this is my very first sermon. I'm actually really nervous. Um, don't know why. Um, I practiced to the empty pews or seats this week. And uh, for some reason, I'm just um, nervous. So... Uh, I know it's a word that we all need to hear, um, and so let's pray. Lord, we ask that you just speak to us, that Lord God, that you challenge us, that Lord, that you uh, that just challenge us, that Lord, as I always pray at this moment, is that Lord, that you take that double-edged sword out of the sheath. And you, you begin to pierce our very being because it is living and active. And Lord God, that the word becomes living and active in our lives. And that Lord, that we can apply it, we can leave here different than what we came in here with. That Lord, the burdens that we came here with, Lord, will, will be left and we walk out the door going, man, I have met with the Lord today. And we thank you for it in your name. Amen. Amen. But talk about the joy of living today. And um, I, I love joy. My favorite, um, I tried to find a happy face shirt to wear this morning because uh, there's just something about when you, when you see someone smiling, you always think there's something wrong with them. Either they, they've done something inappropriate or they're looking at you because you look funny, or, you know, there's a whole variety of different reasons why people smile. Maybe they're just in a good mood, but you're always looking for a reason for that, right? There, there's always a reason. I always think that if you see someone smiling way too much, you're wondering what they're up to, yeah. right? And, and so I don't have to worry about that this morning because some of you aren't smiling at all, so I don't even have to worry about it because some of you guys are actually trying to stay awake. So, just kidding. Wow, tough crowd this morning. So, all right, Acts 20, verse 35. It is more blessed to give than receive. Pastor, are you going to talk about tithing this morning? <laughs> Absolutely not. In fact, it says this, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak remember the words of the Lord. Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In Acts 4, 32-37, it says this, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continue to testify to the re resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerful at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from the time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. It was given out or distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now you're really wondering, what are, you, are we going to have to sell something? Are we going to have to lay it at your feet? By the way, I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm a pastor. Uh, I'm going to teach you from the word. That's what a pastor means, teacher or shepherd. But I, I just wanted to give you this idea that it is joyful. It is blessed to give than receive. But, but I begin to study a little bit more. William Barclay told a prominent notice given in a London Central YMCA to, to, to death funeral and memorial service of a man named Basil Oliver, who had lived in the Y for 30 years, serving as an errand boy and died at the age of 85. This was in a, entitled In the Hands of God in the New York Harper Row, 1966. Pages 11 to 13 if you really wanted to look it up. <laughs> Basil collected papers, went for stamps, ran errands, did all kinds of odd jobs, brought the Sunday papers, served tea and coffee, and was always willing and glad to help. 
Only after he died did people find out what he did. See, Barclay made three significant observations about this man. One, he was exceedingly happy. Two, he was supremely useful. And three, he was exceptionally kind. The man whose death was being announced had provided a brilliant example of a person who provided both joy for himself, love for others by simply doing little things that came to his hand in the place where, he, where life had set him. He had come to know the highest joy of living. If you would know the highest joy of living, you would discover the joy of giving. Amen. So where do you search for the highest joy in, in life? Where do you overcome despair and depression? And what do you find the meaning and purpose of fulfillment? In this day and age, we find purpose and fulfillment in, in this day is we see enough ads to say, hey, you need this, we'll give you joy, and you'll find purpose and joy, and you buy this item. Uh, Carrie spoke about it at the women's conference. You, you, you put this lotion on, you'll be beautiful. <laughs> you, you, uh, uh, um, I, I, I preached a sermon to a bunch of kids. There was this bod body spray, and in the, in the commercial says, I want your bod. Because you put your body spray on. It doesn't make a difference. Eventually, you're still going to stink. The very fact is, it doesn't matter what you buy, that will just temporarily make you happy. It's, it's this joy that we think, this, this temporary joy the world thinks is going to provide for you because you spent X amount of dollars for this. It doesn't matter. The joy of the Lord is your strength. When we grasp this, this is why Basil had found his joy. It was serving others. When we grasp that, it's, it's about the serving. And you thought, well, you're going to talk about tithing because it is blessed to give than receive. Then we talk about Acts 4 where they sold everything. The very fact, if you're willing not to give up what isn't yours in the first place, to give unto the Lord, then, then you're never going to know what true joy is. I didn't get an amen out of there, man. Forget it. The very fact is this. We, people are searching for joy. My wife sent me an unannounced email, which wasn't hers, from a famous uh, person. Someone uh, used her email. And I thought my wife was really encouraging me to try these vitamins. I love vitamins. I try ultimate vitamins and, and so I, I bought these vitamins and it, it was like lose weight for, for 14 and a half pounds in 30 days and I'm like yes I can take these cool pills and they're gonna make me reduce in size and I and I got the bottle and I I looked at the bottle and it told me oh it's gonna give you more energy it's gonna make you happier it's gonna and they're like horse pills and it like had the word 3,000 on the bottle. I was like, yeah, I should have brought it. It was really cool. Had a muscle man. I was like, I'm going to have muscles now. I'm going to have a six pack. I'm going to be joyful. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to. So I bought it because I thought my wife was really encouraging me, right? And so I contacted her. I says, baby, what, I, I, you know, I got those, those vitamins that you told me to buy. She goes, what are you talking about? Well, you know, you, you sent me this email. So I thought I'd spend 50 bucks on these vitamins that you and she goes, what? I didn't send you anything. You just got trapped. <laughs> and so now I'm taking pills that, you know, haven't helped me lose anything. But I'm st since I paid that much for these vitamins, I'm going to take them. I lost 50 bucks. Not 50 pounds. The very fact is this, is we try to find joy in what people tell us that we can find joy in. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7 is this. See, we can't really find joy in stuff or the lies people tell us, right? In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7 says, the point of this is this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountiful will also reap bountiful. Each one must do as he has made up in his mind, not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. How deep is that? 
Come on. Sometimes when, when God expressly speaks to us to do something, sometimes we're reluctant, right? If you can't do it joyfully, don't do it. Because out of this, the mouth speaks. Out of this, the mouth speaks. I don't have a wall. Out of that, your mouth speaks too. Your heart speaks too, right? Sometimes what is in our wall, I don't have... We sometimes, we get caught up in, in our, what our lifestyle we think we should have. And we don't really live in that lifestyle. We, we make this idea that we have to be like the Joneses. Instead, we need to be like God. God was a guy that, that would go and wash someone's feet. The Lord was, was someone that would humble himself. He came to those that he would serve. It, to give. What does it really mean? It's not always monetary. Sometimes it's your time. And sometimes we are, we as people say, not another thing do I have, can, can I give up? Because I don't have any time for my self. I need me time. Right? Me time. Everyone wants my time. Me time. The Lord wants my time. My family wants my time. I don't have any time for me time. You know what I've always learned in myself is that me time is always someone else's. I was pretty stoked that uh, Friday was... I haven't had a real day off for a while, so I thought, okay, I'm going to have a day off. I'm going to have my cookie day. Everyone, My wife even bought me cookies. I was stoked, so I, I did men's Bible study, and, and then I came home, and I was like, going to have cookies, and then all of a sudden, four guys showed up at my house. We did a counseling session until about noon, and I went, awesome. I was pretty happy. It was cool, but I realized it wasn't my time. Because I like to sit on the couch and eat my cookies and watch a movie. And drink your milk. Yeah. Well, the cookies got to go in the milk. And then so, then I realized, and it's not a big deal, because it's important that we go to prayer meetings. Well, on Friday night, we had a prayer meeting for Kiefer, so I went to the prayer meeting. And that was awesome. And I'm like, ah, an hour. And so I'm in the, in the prayer meeting, and I get this text saying that there was... A young uh, Riker went to the hospital. And I'm thinking, I, it's important. I need to do this. It's not inconvenience. It's something that I need to do. So I, I called my wife, and my wife says, okay, we'll see you when you get home. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. So I jumped in my car, got some gas, bought a Mountain Dew, because I knew it was probably going to be a late night. And, and went to the hospital in Iowa. And I'm like, okay. We have to realize that even though we have this idea that it's our time, it ultimately is always God's time. Uh -huh. Don't hear me complaining. I'm saying it doesn't matter. We might have a schedule, but ultimately it's God's time. Yeah. And if God puts it in your way, give it to him and allow him, because he'll give you the strength to get through. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's off topic. I, I... Number one, God loves a cheerful giver. If we're talking about tithing, God loves us. Our church is blessed. We, you guys give and give and give, and there's always, you know, if there's ever a need, you guys meet the need, God loves you. So God loves a cheerful giver. The cheerful giver has security and grace and goodness, and God's bountiful. A cheerful giver has become a channel through which God can give abundantly. God has used you in that way. If we're talking about monetary, if we're talking about time, God has literally, you guys have given and given and given. So praise the Lord for you. Let me encourage you in that. Say, woohoo! Give yourself on a pat on the back because you have done what God has 
done, but sometimes when God has get, asked you to give more than you can ever imagine, you say, I can't do that. Remember that God is able and God is able to work through you. God is able to provide through you if you are just willing to say, God, use me. God is a, a cheerful giver, has become the producer rather than the remaining a parasite. Just remember, an unborn baby is totally dependent on his or her mother. Always. The cheerful giver has discovered the, the highest joy of, of being. On Sunday morning, when we give, and this goes back to tithing, you know, I, I love it. it. It says in the Bible to give with a joyful heart. You know, I remember Vo saying, we should laugh. You know, when we give on Sunday morning, it shouldn't be like, I forgot my tithe. Or I can't give this week because I didn't get a paycheck. I remember the Bible. I have too many wires. The last person did that broke it. So sometimes I remember when I did children's ministry. There was these little kids that would come in with a quarter. <laughs> Pastor Till, all I have is a quarter because that's all my mom and dad gave me. I'm sorry. And all of a sudden they just drop it in the, the bag. Or the, the bucket. You know that one quarter was like the widow's mite. That did more than that, that kid would ever could imagine. But you know what? He was willing to give what he had. What does that mean with let's talk about your finance first. If you're willing to withhold from what God has blessed you with, how is God going to bless your finances? Let's talk about your time. Well, no, God's just talking about your, your, my money. No, he's talking about your time as well. How much time are you giving to the Lord? That's the outside of going to church. Church is not time. Let's talk about being a cheerful giver of your life. Remember the little kid, I talked about it when I did children's ministry. Yes, I did children's ministry. I'm a great balloon animalist. He says, Mom, my mom and dad gave me this little quarter. You know, I can buy a bubblegum machine, you know, bubblegum at the Pizza Hut. Can't buy much with that, so I, two quarters. And I, I love it that on our money it says, In God we trust. And people are trying to take that off our money now. But the very fact is, we as Christians should be the statement in God we trust in every area of our life. Right. That God loves a cheerful giver and we should be happy whenever we have the opportunity to give. And, and I love it that even when we only have a few quarters, a few cents, or maybe just a little bit, maybe just a few moments of our time to give, in a project. Be faithful. Be faithful to that. And this is not a conviction. This is an encouragement because you guys are really faithful to that. I mean, there has not been one time that I had to take a second offering because we have not made the needs of the church. So I'm trying to really encourage you in this. So don't take this as, man, he's talking about tithing again. No, I'm talking about, hey, God is so good and God has used you and God has taken your widow might and God has really moved through you and God has done great things through you. So please continue on and don't be discouraged, but be encouraged. Amen. The cheerful giver has discovered the joy of Jesus. In Luke 6, 38, it says this, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your laps for the measure you give and will be back, measured back to you. 
God rejoices and loves a cheerful giver because of the harvest that will come. Remember the old song by Ray Boltz, thank you for giving unto the Lord. In Matthew 10, 42, it says this, and whoever gives to the one of those little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I will say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Let's be honest, number two, being a cheerful giver is not always easy. To be a giver is not instinctive. It's not easy because we didn't. That it's always, hey, it's me. It's about me. Isn't it? We like to please ourselves. It's, it's not instinctive. People are, were, are born as getters, not givers. Giving is a habit that we must learn. It's not always easy. It's a not, not a natural different development of life. It is something that becomes a habit. A joyful of giving must be experienced to be believed. It, it, it says it is, mu, it, is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is really a test. Test and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Watch what he does. I've seen it over and over in people's lives, in my own life, that God has taken care of. To become a cheerful giver, you must begin giving what you have. I, I, here's why, why I put that down is sometimes I have gone to these gigantic mega churches and you sit down in the, the pew and you pull out their tithing envelopes and says you can put down your credit card's number. When you put your credit card number, that is not tithing. That is becoming indebtedness. That is not money you have earned. It's a tithe on what you've earned. Not on what you're indebting yourself to. Someone asked me, Pastor Tim, why have you not done online giving yet? I'll tell you why I have not done online giving. Because there's a whole lot of ramifications. Up. Because if you do online giving, you have to give the company 2.97% of what you have given. Your tithe is not a tithe anymore. And I can't really justify good stewards unless you guys want to pay that 2.97% plus your tithe. I don't think that's right. I, I had a big discussion at General Counsel about that uh, with, these, with these stewardship people. I said, I have a real problem with that. I, I, I think it's a really great idea, but you know, until you can give it to me for free, you know, I know you've got to make money, but I, I, I feel that we have to be good stewards of God's money. So what you have... Number three, how to become a cheerful giver. Smile more. <laughs> Laugh a little bit more. When you give your time, look like you really are happy about it. You know, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. You're blessed. Yes. Number one, you, must, you first must find your greatest security in God's grace, forgiveness, and love. It's not about your finances. God is greater than your wallet. I love the old commercial, what's in your wallet? Who cares? God is in my heart. Nothing is in my wallet. I am blessed beyond measure. I feel bad when sometimes I'm in like a big city and there's a homeless guy, he goes, can you spare a few coins? I don't even have a few coins. Can you spare a few coins? <laughs> sometimes I carry an apple when I'm at a hotel and I'll hand them the apple. We should be happy. Joyful. You should see yourself as a recipient of how many unearned resources you have have you ever just walked in your house or jumped in your car and just said man I don't deserve this I sit in my office sometimes and look at my computer and go man I don't deserve this and sometimes I sit in this church, and I say, man, I don't deserve this. 
That's not negative, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 I come in to, to realize in myself that what I deserve is hell. Not as much grace as I've gotten. When we realize how blessed we are, that should make us joyful. Uh, Unearned blessings we got. Ever so often I get to watch Holly and, and Vernon on their Lulu. Yeah, thank you. I want to call it something else, and it sounds Frenchy when I say it. And, and they're happy when they're selling these clothes. Vernon a little bit more. <laughs> and, and the very fact is, God has blessed them with this, but they're doing so much more with that. When we begin to realize that God has blessed us, and then when we realize that God has blessed us with all this stuff, then we realize that stuff isn't ours. I remember one time I was thinking, oh man, that car's gone. Our yellow car died for like four months now. It should be coming back soon. Coming back from the dead. <laughs> and I was realizing that I had to ride my bike more than I... And I remember in Illinois, we were, I had one car. And Carrie and I were sitting one time going, we'll never have two cars. And because we couldn't afford two, one car. And I was like, okay, God, you are in control. And then someone came and says, hey, you want to buy a car? I'm like, I have no, I'm a youth pastor. <laughs> and this guy goes, you want to buy a car? And I says, and he was the best mechanic in, in, El in Jacksonville, Illinois. And I says, okay, I guess I can figure this out. He was one of the board members. And when a board member comes and you go, you want to buy a car? You kind of say, yes, sir, because he actually knows how much I make. And he offered me this car for 100 and I was like, I guess I could squeeze that somewhere. 100 bucks was big for me. He said, no, you don't understand. It's 100 pennies. That was my second car in ministry. 100 pennies. A dollar. And I did pay him pennies. That's what he wanted. And I says, I, he says, will you come over to my house so you can test drive it? I don't need to test drive a car that you're going to sell me for a buck. And then after that, every time we gave that to a, a single mom when we left Illinois. Because someone gave us a minivan. And the door broke on that one and I gave it to somebody else. And then someone gave us a pickup. Gave that pickup to somebody else. Yep. Every time someone gave us a car, we gave it away. When we don't need it anymore. When God blesses us with another. That's how God works. It's not our stuff. When you realize that, everyone's like going, Pastor, we know you don't need that car anymore. No, we really do until I get two girls out of my house and I won't need but two cars. But God, when we realize what we have that is in our hands is not our own, remember, God loves a cheerful giver. How do you become that? Realizing it's not your stuff. Remember the guy that we talked about named Basil at the beginning? Realizing, just finding to do for God and being joyful about it. Listen to this. God gave his son to die for our sins. Christ Jesus gave his son on the cross as a substitute for each one of us. Through the Holy Spirit offers us the rich gift of forgiveness, new life, and help to live abundant life. See, God is a great giver, and you and I discover the highest joy of living when we discover joy of being a giver in every area of our life. We have the greatest example of giving. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That's amazing. And I hope this morning encouraged you about joy. You're like, oh, but you talk more about giving. No, I talked about joy. 
realizing you don't have to worry about the pressures of life because the stuff that is in your possession is not yours, but it's his, and we can find true joy. Amen. There's an old song, I'm not going to lead you. It says, if you're happy, you know it, clap your hands. Mm-hmm. You know, the very fact, if you're happy and you know it, you're going to clap your hands. And you don't have to clap your hands. Trust me, I don't want to sing that song because I'm not a kid's pastor anymore. But why did they have to do that? It was a response. Because there's something in your heart that needs a response. If you'd stand with me. This is your response. Lord, today you've taught us that it's blessed to give than receive. But it's not just about giving, it comes from the heart where joy begins. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you are great and you are awesome. And that, Lord, it's really what comes about the joy is really, it's all about you and how great and awesome and amazing and brilliant you are. And Lord, I ask for each person today, Lord, they hear the truth about joy and the joy that comes from you. And Lord, we thank you that you are so real and that you are so amazing. Lord, I ask that as we enjoy the fundraiser downstairs, that Lord, it's help us sending our kids to the convention. But Lord, It's a gathering. It's about our church gathering together as a family. To fellowship. But Lord, I also that we come back tonight and we talk about your presence. Lord, you've been speaking to me about that. All week you kept on changing in my mind what I need to talk about tonight. But Lord, you are great. You work all things out. And Lord, I ask that you just bless every single person in this room. Amen. God bless you guys.